there are very few things as satisfying as being able to destroy stuff and being rewarded for that. Typically, if you cause downtime in production or if you make a mistake in the latest release that causes the application to be unresponsive or when we do things like that, we get punished. But if we do those same things through chaos engineering, we get rewarded because we uncover the weaknesses of our system. So today we are going to explore one of the tools that can help us to rain chaos on our system. And that tool is Litmus. Specifically, we are going to use Litmus version 2, which is a huge change compared to Litmus that you might be using or you might be thinking of using and so on and so forth. I was fortunate enough to use Litmus 2 while still in beta and what you're about to see are the things that are still not released. Or maybe they are, depending on when you're watching this video. Anyways, we are going to explore Litmus version 2 as the potential candidate for your go-to tool for your chaos experiments. Litmus 2 is a huge change. It's a massive change. And I love it. Or maybe I don't, depending. Some things are, uh, some things are amazing. Anyways, let's explore it. Let's take a look at it together and then comment on what is good, what is bad, whether you should use it or not. There are two major changes to Litmus version 2 compared to previous versions. The first one is integration with Argo workflows, which brings a ton of benefits which you will see soon. And the second one is the new web UI. Now, I'm not very fond of web UIs. If you're watching my channel, you know that that's not my thing. But in case of Litmus, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Or to be more precise, it can be absolutely fantastic. But we are going to get to that. For now, what matters is that I already have a cluster up and running. I installed Litmus in that cluster. And that's about it. The instructions of the commands I executed before I started recording this session and all the commands that I will be executing from now on are in a gist. And the link to the gist is in the description of this video. So go and check it out if you want to reproduce what I'm doing or maybe follow along. Now, when you open the Litmus UI, you will have to put a username and password. By default, it is admin Litmus. And once you log in, you will be asked to change the password. I will not do that because I am lazy. So let's pass that authentication and see what we can do with uh, new Litmus 2.0. Exciting. Most of the additions, the most of the things that matter in the new UI, in new Litmus, are floating around workflows. So you will be creating workflows, and those workflows will contain your chaos experiments, and they will be scheduled, they will be running, and so on and so forth. So let's schedule the first workflow and see how it goes. Now, once you start the web UI and you try to schedule a workflow, you will see that there are no agents and you might be compelled to click the button that says deploy new agent. Don't do that, at least not yet. It takes a while after we bring up the UI for the agent to be up and running in the existing cluster, in the cluster where the UI is running. So give it a few moments and then refresh the screen and the agent will be running. Later on, if you want to add agents to other clusters, you can do that. But for now, the one running in the cluster where Litmus is running should be good enough. So refresh the screen if you do not see the agent up and running. So select the agent, click the next button, and let's select uh, the type of the workflow we are going to create. If this is your first contact with Litmus, especially Litmus 2, you might want to select the easy option, which is to create a new workflow from one of the predefined workflows. So let's see how the predefined workflows work, and then we are going to jump into the real deal and create our own workflow. Because let's face it, the predefined workflows are good only for you to see what is possible. It's not something you will be using. We can select an application, one of the predefined applications that will be used for chaos experiments. I'm going to select Potato Head, which is an application used in many open source projects simply because Potato Head is used to demonstrate different deployment mechanisms normally. And from there on, it was picked up by others. Anyways, let me select Potato Head and click the next button and see what happens. Workflow settings is uneventful. The only curious thing is that it has a short description, one or two sentences, and in that short description, there are at least five spelling errors. And that is a specially cool discovery coming from me because English is not my native language, yet those spelling errors are kind of bothering me, right? 
On the next screen, we can see the workflow, which contains one experiment, only one. This is a simple templated uh, example, and we can edit that experiment, which I'm not going to do right now. We are going to create and edit and update and do stuff with experiments later. For now, what matters is that this predefined experiment will delete the pod and then double check whether the application is still operational. So it defines the steady state, it performs some actions by removing a pod, and then it confirms that steady state continues being steady, that the action of removing a pod did not affect uh, the application itself. We can also click on Edit YAML, which will show us Argo Workflows uh, manifest, and that shows why using a web UI for Litmus uh, combined with Argo Workflows is very important, because creating those workflows is painful, it's horrible. Now, I love Argo Workflows. I think it is extremely good, extremely powerful, but it is also a bit low level. It is not user-friendly. And if you would try to define from scratch yourself the workflow that contains the experiments, you would potentially suffer greatly. Fortunately for us, Litmus itself will create workflows which are sort of pipelines that will run those experiments and we do not need to worry about them, at least not initially. Maybe later when you master Litmus and Argo workflows combined and you start calling yourself ninja that can do anything, then you might want to deep dive into how workflows work and how they can be combined with chaos. For now, I will ignore that definition and see the experiment in action. Next, we can adjust the weight of experiment. We can give it points, like anything between 0 and 10, and then we can weigh our experiments and say, hey, those are more important, those are less important. I'm not sure I see the usefulness in all this, but hey, if you want to put some kind of points to different experiments and rank them somehow, rank their importance, then you can do that. Next, we can choose whether to schedule it to run now or to schedule it to run periodically. Normally, you want to run your experiments periodically, once a day, once an hour, random intervals, once a week, whatever you think would be a good frequency. But for now, I'm going to choose to run it right now because, hey, you don't want to wait until a next schedule is on. Then we got the summary with saying, hey, this is what you're planning to do, blah, 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 not important. Let's click the finish button and finally, finally run the experiment. And there we are, the experiment is running. We have a graph view that shows us pretty colors, you know, circles with uh, different steps in a pipeline that are being executed. Uh, right now it is installing the application, meaning it is deploying potato head sample or demo application. And we can just marvel at how beautiful this UI is. I mean, I'm kidding, it's irrelevant. What matters is that we can observe the results of the experiment uh, and wait for it to happen, or you can go and grab some coffee. I will probably speed up to the end of this process and see what happens. And there we are, the experiment is finished, we have the result, everything is green, everything is positive, everything is amazing, which is normal because it is a sample experiment with a sample application. We're going to see what happens when an experiment fails later. For now, I have the first negative observation, and that's Argo workflows. I mean, I love Argo workflows. I think it is potentially the best solution for self-managed pipelines type of tool, but Argo Workflows is designed to run at scale. And in this case, I'm not running anything at scale. And the problem with that is that with Argo Workflows, every step is a separate container and Litmus images are kind of heavy and it takes time until they're pulled and it takes time until containers start. And then we need to wait until it installs stuff, which is kind of silly. And then finally the experiment ran and it was successful. And then it reverted to the previous state, which is great. That's what experiments should always do and it deleted the sample application and it was a bit slow. Now that is not a big deal because it doesn't really matter whether your experiments take a few seconds to execute or a minute. But hey, if it could be faster, it would be better, but it's not because that's how Argo workflows is designed. It might have a slightly different purpose than what it's used here for. On the other hand, if I would be involved in Litmus, I would probably choose Argo Workflows as well because it's awesome, even though it's slow. And we can select any of the steps in the workflow, in the pipeline, see the logs. Logs are a bit heavy, there's too much going on here and it's very hard sometimes to deduce what's going on and what matters and what is just uh, noise. What matters nevertheless is that logs are there, you can see the logs of every individual step. 
personally, I prefer table view. You know, the graph is awesome. It looks great, but it's, I believe, less useful than the table view. So I usually go there to check the status of my stuff. I think it kind of shows a more useful view, even though it might not be as pretty, let's say. Now, apart from blocks, we can see chaos results. Now, this is second negative point I have for Litmus version 2. It shows me Kubernetes manifests. Now, I'm a Kubernetes guy. I love Kubernetes, but I really do not expect to see Kubernetes manifest for that specific virtual step. What I would like within chaos results is to remove all that noise and show me the things that are relevant to the experiment. Was it successful? Was it failed? And if it failed, why did it fail? That's what I expect from Chaos Results and not the Kubernetes Manifest. I do not want to see the equivalent of kubectl describe blah, blah, blah. I would like to see the results of my Chaos experiment and see whether there is a problem, whether it's successful. It should be much shorter. It should have less noise. But hey, you might like a lot of noise. I don't. In this specific case, I can see that the experiment passed. Hey, I'm happy. We can move on and see how we can create our own experiments. Now, to run experiments, the real experiments, not the template, I need an application. So I will deploy a silly application. And to do that, I will create a namespace production and then deploy the application. The reason why I'm creating a namespace called production is because I believe that outside of practice, maybe, chaos experiments should always, always, always run in production. Running chaos experiments in staging or in any other environment is almost silly. I want to see what happens in a real environment, how real users might be affected and not in a simulation, which is staging, pre-production or whatever you might be having. Now, if you need to practice, practice outside of production. But when you do run real experiments, run them in production. But in this case, I cannot show you production of a real company because that would not be ethical. Probably I would get fired for that, what's or not. So I will simulate production by creating a production namespace and then deploying a silly application inside of production. Okay, now that uh, my production simulation is up and running, we are going to create yet another experiment. This time we are going to start from scratch. We are not going to use a template and we are going to see how it goes. And to do that, I'm going to schedule a new workflow or a new experiment or a set of experiments and then go through all of the steps and see what we have there. And the first step or the second step after selecting the self-agent or whatever it's called is to choose to create a new workflow based on the experiments uh, in my hub, which is the name for Litmus Hub, basically. You could create your own hub with your own set of experiments, but I'm going to use the one provided by Litmus. So let's get going with my hub, a silly name though. I'm going to create a new workflow using the experiments from my hub. The workflow settings are allow me to type some title and some description. Boring, let's skip through that. Now the screen that is called tune the selected workflow is where the real action is defined, where the real deal is happening. And I'm going to add a new experiment and see which type of experiments do I have available out of the box. I think that there are around 50 different experiments available, uh, but I do not want to scroll through all of them. So let's take a look at what we have for, let's say, AWS. Let's see what we can do with AWS. There is not much we can do with AWS, and this is what third maybe negative point, but this one is not directly related with Litmus version 2, but with Litmus in general. Litmus is very much focused on Kubernetes, and that is great. We are yet to see whether it does a good job with uh, running chaos experiments inside Kubernetes cluster, but it would be great if we could do experiments that target things outside of the cluster, because more often than not, I want to see what happens if a cluster goes down, what happens when something goes wrong with the networking or storage or what's not, right? So another third, I think, negative point, I would like Litmus to go beyond Kubernetes. It does, but in such a limited fashion that I feel that there's a lot of work to be done there. So at this point, I cannot recommend Litmus for running your experiments that attack infrastructure, but only for the experiments within your Kubernetes cluster. Or at least that's the hope I have. Now let me filter the experiments by Kubernetes. Let's search for Kubernetes. What can I do within Kubernetes? And it seems that I can do nothing in Kubernetes, which is kind of silly for two reasons. First, because Litmus is mostly focused on Kubernetes. And second, because I know that Litmus has experiments that are targeting Kubernetes. That's the main thing about Litmus. 
but this search simply is kind of silly. So I should probably search for pods. Let's see, what can I use? Maybe generic pod delete. That sounds like something that uh, would be a good first uh, experiment. Let's destroy some pods or delete some pods. Now I'm thrown back to the previous screen. I would have expected that I'm asked, okay, so which pod do you want to delete? What do you want to do with it? I was not asked that. I probably need to click to the newly added line that says uh, pod delete. So let's see whether I can get the options I'm looking for over there. I just have to do an additional step, which I don't like doing. Am I crazy? Is this too much to ask to have I don't know, maybe I'm too picky. So the general settings, I will leave them as they are and see what's next. Target application. Now we're getting to the real deal and we can select the things that matter over here. Annotation check is set to false, uh, meaning that if you annotate your applications properly, then you can run experiments with uh, lower permissions and what's or not. You should probably do that. I didn't, so I will leave it to false. And let me see the fields that I have here. I can select the application namespace and I love this. I love that I do not need to remember things. I can just select from the drop-down list and the values in the drop-down are taken directly from my cluster, from the agents. So the agent figured out which namespaces I have and then it shows me the namespaces in a list. I like this, this is nice. So I will select production and then the type of the resource I want to manipulate one way or another. I will leave it to deployment and let's see the labels. I should select my deployment or the pods that were created through the replica set which were created through the deployment. Anyway, Kubernetes Madness. I can select the labels by clicking uh, that field and getting the list from a drop-down list. This is nice. This saves me from memorizing things. I like that it is evaluating uh, the resources in a cluster and giving me the right choices to choose from. Okay, that part is fine. Let's see the next section and see what we have there. And in the next section, we can add probes. We can probe our application because really deleting stuff, destroying stuff, doing damage without uh, sending any probes to see what happens after we create some chaos would be pointless. So probes are a must. They're not mandatory in Litmus. I mean, they probably should be, but anyways, we need to add a probe. I will add one, a simple one. Let's see what I can choose from. I can type the name of the probe. Uh, what should I do? Ingress. I will, I will do something with Ingress, some, something with networking or requests. I will leave HTTP as the probe type because that happens to do the things that I wanted to do. And the probe mode will continue being continuous. There are other modes which you can explore in detail yourself. Anyways, uh, continuous means that it will run the experiment and send the probes continuously in a loop during a specific period of time. Then we have prop properties like timeouts, retries, and things like that. I will put all of those to one, one second, one retry, and so on and so forth. Is what really matters. I will need to figure out the address of my application. I will go to the terminal session, get the address, and then return here and paste the address. And uh, that should be, that's the address of the application that I want to probe. You can select insecure skip verify, which is a strange name. Doesn't matter. Anyways, depending on whether you have certificates or you don't, you would select one thing or the other. And finally, we get to the request. I want to send a get request and I want that request to return 200. And if I get anything else, anything beyond 200, it would prove that my application is not responsive in situations when one of the pods fail or die or something terrible happens to them. Now I could click add probe here right now and that would result in a negative effect in something that I don't want to happen. And this is what, is this a fourth, fourth negative point for Litmus, uh, at least version two, is that the fields are not mandatory. It does not really define which fields are mandatory and which are not. And in this case, for this to function properly, I need to select the criteria and say equals equals, meaning that the response from the get request must be equal to 200, or I could have selected something else, but equals equals should do. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is that the UI is not really bulletproof. It does not prevent me from making bad decisions or forgetting to fill in the fields that should be mandatory and things like that. So let's edit that probe and see what happens. Finally, I think that this is the last step. We can tune the experiment. We can specify the duration of the chaos, which by default is 30 seconds. I think I will leave it to that. And we have chaos interval, which by default is 10 seconds, meaning that every 10 seconds it will run some chaos experiments and probes and what's or not. And all that will be happening during the period of 30 seconds. I will leave it to that.
I'm getting impatient, so let's finish this and uh, see the results. Now, there is one important and not very intuitive thing here. There is that uh, revert schedule checkbox that can be set to true or false. And if you're anything like me, you might not know what that is. It is not very intuitive. It took me a while to figure it out, but what it really means is that if you leave it to true, then it will delete the experiments, the workflow after a while, and then you will not be able to retrieve the logs. And if you set it to false, then the results of your experiments, the workflow run, the Argo workflow run will be persisted and it will exist for longer, and then you will be able to see the logs. So depending on whether you select true or false here, you will or you will not be able to see the logs which is kind of silly. Okay, points, let's skip through that and schedule it to run right now. I do not want to wait. I want to see this in action as soon as possible. Actually, before I click finish, one more reminder that we can see the pure definition, you know, the YAML of the resource that will be applied to Kubernetes cluster that will run Argo workflow, which contains all the definition of the experiment. And if you really want to read this whole manifest, I congratulate you. I think that you're a very patient person. From my side, I think it's incredibly long and convoluted and hard to understand. So the more you use the UI to define the experiments, the better. So the experiment is running. It will take a while. So let me fast forward to the end of the process and see the result. Okay, now we got to the part that it is deleting the pod and then it will run some probes. So let me go back to the terminal, list all the pods and see whether it is really deleting the pod or it is faking it. And yes, you can see on my screen that the old pod uh, is terminating the one that was created five minutes ago and the new pod is being created in its place. That's what Kubernetes is doing, right? Kubernetes deployment is making sure that a specific number of pods is always running. However, since this application has only one replica, there is a downtime period. There is a period between one pod being terminated and the other one not yet started started that uh, would probably cause the downtime and my application is probably not responsive all the time simply because I have only one replica of my application. But let's see whether the experiment itself will prove this theory as being true and whether my application is not responsive when a pod goes down. Now it's again about waiting so let's fast forward to the very end of this process. And it did fail. And that was to be expected because, hey, what should happen if there is only one replica of an application? When that replica goes down, the application is not responsive simply because Kubernetes needs a couple of moments until a new replica is up and running. Now, this application is simple and it is easy to deduce the cause of the problem of the issue. But let's imagine that we do not know what caused the issue and what is the problem. So let's take a look at the logs and try to deduce what we already know. Now we can see in the logs what is the address of the application that it is trying to reach. And we can also see that the response code that we are getting is 503, while the probe is expecting the response code 200. Now logs are potentially huge and it might require a bit of work to find the specific entries that tell you what the issue is. So let's take a look at the chaos results. Maybe that will provide an easier to digest output that we might consult. And chaos results are actually less helpful than logs. Chaos results are basically equivalent of executing kubectl describe and getting the whole manifest with its current state and there is an entry or two that just tells you, hey, it failed or it is successful. So chaos results are almost useless. But logs are not. Logs are showing us the information we need, even though there might be more information than we actually do need. Now let's continue the simulation of the process. And now that we know that there is an issue with this application, and the issue is that it is not responsive when one of the pods, the only pod actually fails. So let's try to apply the fix. And the fix can be as easy as scaling the application to, let's say, three replicas. So I'm going to modify the deployment manifest of the application and say, hey, I want to run three replicas of this application because hopefully that will help my application be more robust and be slightly harder to bring it down or at least make it not responsive for a short period of time. So let me deploy a modified version of the application that will have this time three replicas and then we will rerun the same experiment and see the outcome, whether we fix it really or we will uncover some other issue related to this experiment. But before we rerun this experiment, let's go to the run section of the workflows and see whether there is some some other useful option that we might want to leverage. Now show experiments doesn't show us much. It's a short summary of all the experiments and we have only one in that workflow, so not much going on there. 
If you click on three dots, you can see a couple of options like show workflow and show the analytics. So let's see what they give us. Show workflow gets us back to that same view, the graph that we saw before. And the analytics, what are analytics? And the analytics are, well, whatever the analytics should be, a bunch of useful or not useful information that we might want to analyze. Since this is only one experiment, analytics are not showing much, but once you design multiple experiments and put them all together in one workflow, then this will be very useful, potentially at least. Now, more interesting, even though maybe not that intuitive view, is schedules. Those are the schedules of our experiments. And to understand the difference between runs and workflows, you need a bit of a background of Argo workflows. Argo workflows has those two options. So this is translation from Argo workflows. Runs are specific runs of each workflow. And schedules are, well, schedules of that workflow. So one schedule can produce multiple runs. And runs are ephemeral. You can almost ignore runs. What really matters are those schedules. That's where definition is, that's where the schedule itself is, and a few other things. So if we go to schedules and we select one of our scheduled uh, experiments, we can rerun them, we can download the manifest, we can save it as a template. Saving it as a template is actually pretty cool because then we can create additional experiments based on that template. And finally, we can delete the workflow. And if that workflow is set to run periodically, then we would delete effectively or prevent it from running any future runs or builds or workflows. So now that I found an issue with an application, I potentially fix that issue. We are yet to discover whether the fix really works. Anyways, I'm going to rerun that workflow and uh, that will tell me whether the fix was successful or there is some other issue. Maybe the fix was wrong in the first place. Now you know what happens next. I'm going to fast forward to the end of the process because I don't want you to wait for a couple of minutes watching me watch the workflow run. And yes, it's successful. I mean, it's a simple application. I did not doubt whether it will be successful or no, but it shows the process. We have an application or multiple applications or the whole system and we design an experiment. And the experiment should have the steady state hypothesis, the definition of the state that should be the same before and after running probes. And then we define one or multiple probes that will affect the system in some way. And the way it affects the system should reflect more or less how real world events would affect the system. And then we combine all those into a workflow. We run the workflow either on demand or periodically, and we see the results. And if there is a failure, then we try to learn from that failure, fix our applications or the system or hardware or whatever we are experimenting on, and we repeat the process until it is fully green. And once the first experiment is green, we add additional experiment and then more experiments and so on and so forth. We repeat the process over and over again until we are confident that the system is robust, that it is fault tolerant, that there is no downtime, no matter what happens to the system, and no matter which external or internal events are messing with it. Now let's see what else do we have with Litmus version 2, release 2. We have Chaos Hubs, there is only one hub by default, you can extend it with additional hubs or additional experiments. And what we have in the default hub is a mixed bag of Kubernetes and not Kubernetes type of experiments. There's a couple of them for AWS, there, is a, there are a few additional ones, but the focus is clearly, at least for now, on Kubernetes. The experiments we have, or experiment templates outside Kubernetes, at least in Litmus, are poor at best. I would not recommend Litmus for the things for experiments outside Kubernetes, but within Kubernetes for your needs inside Kubernetes cluster, so far it's absolutely amazing, it's excellent. But we did not finish the review. I will talk about it later because there are some dark sides as well. Next we have agents. I have only one agent in this demo, but normally you would run Litmus in one cluster, deploy agents in all the other clusters that you have, and run experiments in one or the other depending on what you're trying to prove or what you're trying to experiment on. Analytics themselves do not bring much out of the box. However, we can design analytics any way we want. We can connect Prometheus and then use the data from Prometheus for our experiments, for our analysis. And that's amazing. It requires a bit of work, but the results are absolutely amazing. Unfortunately, I do not have time to deep dive into that part of Litmus, but try it out yourself and you'll see. 
Finally, settings have typical things like the information about your account, the teams, the users, and stuff that we normally have in almost every application. But there is one very special thing in settings, and that's the tab that says GitOps. And if we go there, we see that by default, it is using Litmus locally, but we can specify a Git repository. And this is the part that I really, really like. And to explain why I like it, I need to explain why I dislike actually web UIs. My, my beef with web UIs is that they are very helpful in observing things, in modifying things, but almost all web UIs are working directly with runtime, with a cluster or whatever the web UI is meant to work with. Hardly any graphical user interface is using Git as the source of information, or at least the manifest that we should modify, create, and what's or not. Litmus is one of the few exceptions, and I love that part. We can tell it which Git repository to use, and from there on, all those workflows that we are defining by clickety, 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 click, will be stored and retrieved from a Git repository. And that's one of the big things, that's one of the huge things that make Litmus version 2 absolutely amazing. It uses Git as the source repository instead of working directly with your cluster. It's not set up to do that by default. And if I would be in the Litmus team, if I would be actively working in a project, my first suggestion would be to put that up front. At the very beginning, when you start in the web UI, I would make that the default or maybe even the only option. Nevertheless, it is absolutely amazing. You just need to know that you need to go to settings, go to GitHub tab, and then specify the Git repository, provide authentication and all the JS. And from there on, Litmus web UI will be storing the manifests of your work in Git, and that is what we really, really want. I'm not sure whether I would call it GitOps, but nevertheless, it is using Git as the source of manifest, and that is, first of all, amazing. And second, it is so simple that I do not understand why all the other providers of web UIs of one thing or another do not use the same approach. You know, like all those Kubernetes dashboards, if they would be doing this, I would not be so negative towards dashboards. But they're not, and Litmus is. And this is a big, huge thumbs up for Litmus. And that's Litmus 2.0 or 2. Point something, depending on when you're watching it. That was Litmus release 2. And it is absolutely amazing. But it is not perfect. It crashed on me once during the recording of this video. I did not include it in here for a simple reason, because it is better. There are quite a few rough edges. There are quite a few things that should be improved. But, and this is a huge one, this is better. I am using beta, and I expect it to be much better in the future. This is not even the first GA release. And even if it would be the first GA, hey, it's first release of something absolutely awesome. If those deficiencies of rough edges persist half a year from now, then I will be very negative towards Litmus. Since it is in early stages, I will give it a slack. And I will say that this is potentially awesome. I love it. I love the direction where it is going. And if it continues going into this direction, Litmus might be become the champion of chaos engineering. I just need two major things from Litmus to become the de facto standard for chaos engineering. First one, it needs to polish all the silly things in the web UI because they are silly and they should be polished and it should be more intuitive and more user-friendly and what's or not. The second important thing that prevents me from saying this is the best ever is that Litmus needs to go beyond Kubernetes. It needs to give me tools and means to do experiments not only inside Kubernetes cluster but also outside on my AWS account, Google account, VMware, something. Whatever my whole system is, Litmus should give me the means to conduct experiments both inside the Kubernetes cluster, but also outside. As it is now, I highly recommend Litmus release 2, but only within your Kubernetes cluster. If you need a tool that will do chaos experiments outside Kubernetes, then you might need to look for something else. That does not mean that that something else should not be combined with Litmus. It is absolutely amazing and potentially one of the best, if not the best tool for chaos experiments within Kubernetes clusters, so you might not want to abandon Litmus because you have needs beyond Kubernetes, but uh, combine Litmus with something else.